Endocrine Medications with Mrs. McGee for Pharmacology 2. This is the endocrine system and the anatomy review for that system. All the glands here and what they do. You guys can read this. Just remember that the endocrine system regulates and integrates the body's metabolic activities to maintain homeostasis. Drug overview for this uh, system is going to be anti-diabetic medications, thyroid and anti-thyroid medications, pituitary medications, and adrenal hormone replacements. Anti-diabetic drugs include insulin, oral anti-diabetics, amylin mimetics, incretin mimetics. <clears throat> Insulins have different um, acting times. There are rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting, and long acting. This graphic shows you how quickly um, and rapidly these things start to work. Um, Lice Pro is the very first one and um, starts working in 15 to 30 minutes. <clears throat> and you can see Lantus is losing the race and doesn't start until 70 minutes, but it's long acting um, and can work for 24 hours. So look this over on your own. Um, the next slide, this one here, is the handout that I gave you. And it is more important that you know the three rapid acting insulins, the short acting insulin, the intermediate acting insulin, and the two long acting insulins. Here is a mnemonic phrase for remembering long acting insulins. Um, they both start with an L, Levomir and Lantus. So triple L for long, and you might remember these. So there's an insulin overview to start with. Um, insulin, if you're going to get it, give it for something that isn't diabetes, that thing is going to be hyperkalemia, which is a high potassium level. But if you're going to give it for diabetes, we can give it for type 1 diabetes. Um, and these people require an external source of insulin. They do not make insulin in their bodies properly. They also have an emergency situation, which is DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. And you will need to give them insulin in that emergency situation also. For type 2 diabetes, um, some patients become insulin resistant, and so they need more insulin than they can possibly produce, and that's why you would give them insulin. Um, they also have an emergency situation um, called HHNK, or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome, and during this situation, you would also give them insulin. More facts about insulin. Remember that you will only give regular insulin IV. No other insulin is allowed to be given IV. The rest are subcutaneous. If you are drawing more than one insulin up into a single syringe, remember that you always draw short before long and clear before cloudy. All dosage adjustments um, need to be individualized per the patient's situation um, and what they're doing with their life. Um, any, there may be increases needed of their dosage um, if they're in an infection situation, stress, growth spurt, or the second and third trimesters of pregnancy. Remember that diet and exercise control blood glucose in your body. So any change in diet or exercise for your patient will require a change in medication. You always want to rotate injection sites. The labs that you need to monitor for insulin include the glycosated hemoglobin, which is a hemoglobin A1C, the urine ketone level, and the finger stick blood glucose. 
Remember, we talked about sliding scale insulin. Um, this is an important thing to note here that some people are on a sliding scale insulin, which in which they give a larger dose of insulin depending on the height of their um, finger stick blood glucose. There are adverse reactions related to insulin. Of course, you can have hypoglycemia. A Samoji effect is when you do have hypoglycemia, but it's followed by a rebound hyperglycemia. So you think that you've cured the problem, maybe even cured it way too much, and it comes back even worse. And then, of course, there's insulin resistance, which we alluded to earlier. The longer that a person is on insulin, the larger their dose may have to be. Remember to swirl and do not shake an insulin vial. It can break up the um, particles in the insulin. Don't use if the color or consistency has changed. This is lifelong therapy. People have to be on insulin for the rest of their life. There is no current cure for diabetes. If you mix insulin, like we were talking about um, a couple of slides ago, inside the same syringe, then you're going to want to administer that immediately. It can lose its potency if it sits too long together in one syringe. Some teaching for your patients, you'll want to make sure that they're doing a daily foot inspection um, because they don't heal well. They want to avoid infection because that increases their insulin needs. They shouldn't be skipping meals. They need to have carbs available for emergencies and they need to know the signs and symptoms of both hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, which are on the next slide. Look here. Here they are. Uh, we have hypoglycemia on the left in the blue, and that's sweating, pallor, irritability, hunger, lack of coordination and sleepiness. Um, hyperglycemia symptoms in the red on the right are dry mouth, increased thirst, weakness, headache, uh, blurred vision, or frequent urination. This is just a infographic to try to help you remember all of the insulins and their acting times. Um, so if you can rewrite this in color for yourself to try to help you remember it, um, it might be a good study tool for you. The first um, medication that we're going to talk about uh, other than insulin is glucagon. Glucagon is kind of the opposite of insulin. It, it raises blood glucose levels. On the route there, I have sub-QIM and IV. There is a PO um, glucagon, but you can only give that to your patient if they're awake. So if this is an injection, you're going to inject over two to three minutes. It is emergency intervention, but if the patient doesn't respond, we have to do even more. We would give an IV push of dextrose 50. That is a really big dose of sugar to help the patient come back or recover their blood glucose levels. This is an infographic about glucagon and it says glucagon when the sugar is gone. That's a reminder of why we give glucagon. It is a first aid kit for severe hypoglycemia. When the patient is so hypoglycemic that it looks like they're comatose or maybe passed out, um, you give the glucagon. It can be given sub-Q, IM, or IV for that emergency situation. Notice that most of this uh, slide is talking about the brain. The brain is very sensitive to your glucose level, so that's why the patient seems to be uh, passed out or comatose when they have a low glucose level and it's very quick that they recover if they're treated. In the bottom right left hand corner um, you can see that it, this drug is reconstituted from a powder so just remember that you cannot use the solution if it isn't clear after you mix it together. 
Oral anti-diabetic agents are the next ones we're going to go over. Glipizide, glucophage, actose, precos, and genuvia. There's an overview for these medications. Most of them work by decreasing gluconeogenesis. They are indicated for type 2 diabetics if diet and exercise can't control the blood glucose levels. We need to monitor the blood glucose at least three times a day before meals. The first time a day is going to be before breakfast, before anything's consumed. <clears throat> um, some of these patients, even though they're on oral diabetic agents, may still need insulin during stressful periods, such as hospitalizations. You want to avoid alcohol when taking prescription medications, especially for diabetic patients. Glipizide is our first medication we're going to talk about. It's also known as glucotrol. This one stimulates insulin release and decreased um, <clears throat> glucose output. It also increases the peripheral sensitivity to insulin. We need to take this 30 minutes before the morning meal. We need to make sure that the patients are monitoring their blood glucose. No one should ever be on an oral diabetic agent and not monitor their blood glucose. One of the biggest problems with this medication is that it causes hypoglycemia due to multiple drug interactions um, with other medications. So we want to make sure that they're not having this problem. There is a case in which they can and cause hyperglycemia, such as with corticosteroids and thiazide diuretics. We want to make sure that the patient is having a regular eating schedule, including good proteins. Some more side effects or adverse reactions include hypersensitivity to the medication and hematologic disorders. Glucophage, or metformin, is the next medication we're going to talk about. It actually decreases the liver production of glucose and decreases the intestinal absorption of glucose and increases insulin sensitivity. So that's a good thing. <clears throat> um, you can get a sustained release, and it is usually taken daily with dinner. The immediate release tabs are taken twice a day with breakfast and dinner. These medications are avoided in pregnancy and lactation. However, um, many doctors prescribe this for their gestationally diabetic um, patients. So at this point, we're thinking about those risks versus benefits. These are indicated in severe infection, shock, or hypoxic issues or conditions. Adverse effects include GI distress. This is the most common one. If you look, it decreases intestinal absorption. So that means that other things will not absorb either. So it kind of moves straight on through. People have diarrhea a lot. They also have the possibility of having a vitamin B12 or folic acid deficiency, and it can even lead to lactic acidosis. This is a life-threatening condition, um, so they'll need intervention, um, but it can lead to hemodialysis or death if not treated. Remember this fact. Do not give metformin with somebody having a procedure that requires contrast dye. Contrast dye plus metformin can cause renal failure. Actose, also known as pyglitazone, um, is a once daily medication. The adverse reactions for this can be fluid retention, so we want to monitor weight gain. It can elevate cholesterol, so you're going to be drawing cholesterol level labs. Um, it can also cause hepatotoxicity. Some of those signs and symptoms include jaundice and dark urine. So we're going to get the labs called LFT, which is called liver function studies or liver function tests. Um, make sure that you are being cautious when you want to try to use this in older adults and especially in heart failure it can make heart failure worse
Um, it's contraindicated with patients who have severe heart failure, history of bladder cancer, or active hepatic disease. Um, you see down at the bottom of the screen the um, example medications. They are in increments of 15. That is titrated to the patient's need up to 45 milligrams. One rare um, adverse reaction is a urinary bladder tumor. Well, let's talk about Genuvia. It's also called Stygaglipin. Um, it is given 100 milligrams daily. Some rare adverse reactions include acute pancreatitis, so you can't give it with patients with a history of pancreatitis. It can also cause respiratory tract infections. It can um, increase symptoms of heart failure. And if your patient has a renal history, then you'll want to adjust the dose for that. So they usually break that dose down to a 50 milligram. Now let's talk about Similin, also known as Pramlanotide. Um, <clears throat> this one is a synthetic hormone, and it decreases blood glucose in, in three different ways. It can decrease the rate that food is actually digested. It decreases the amount of glucose produced in the liver. It also gives patients a feeling of fullness. So they're not eating as much, period. It is available for glucose control in types 1 and 2 diabetes. This is a subcutaneous medication, and you give it prior to each meal. This is not a medication that you mix with any other medications. Um, if you miss a dose of this medication, you'll want to wait until the next scheduled dose, not try to make that up. It is questionable in pregnancy and lactation, and we do not give this medication to children. So we usually give this in conjunction with oral anti-diabetics such as metformin or glipizide. There are some adverse reactions, including nausea, and if this nausea lasts for days, um, the dose may be too high, so we could decrease that to help them. Uh, there's hypoglycemia, of course. Um, this usually happens three hours after taking the medication, so you'll want to monitor the patient for that or teach the patient to monitor themselves for that. Um, there can be a reaction at the injection site. These, this medication is contraindicated in people with kidney failure or who are on dialysis because of kidney failure. Uh, we want to be cautious um, in the use of patients who have delayed gastric emptying, also known as gastroparesis, uh, thyroid disease, osteoporosis, or alcohol use disorder. Keep any unopened vials in the refrigerator, and like I said before, do not mix this medication in any syringe with another medication, including insulin. It is not the same as insulin. Um, there the doctors will monitor the patient's compliance um, to the regimen, to the diet, to their um, finger stick in schedule very closely. And if they notice that non-compliance is a problem, they can discontinue the therapy on that. Um, the patient is non-compliant. Biata or Exnatide is the next one. Um, it is for, given for type 2 diabetes. It's a subcutaneous medication. It is given twice a day, BID, um, 60 minutes prior to meals. One of the big adverse reactions is acute pancreatitis. It is contraindicated in kidney failure. If you're seeing a pattern here, please note that most of these medications are contraindicated in kidney failure. Um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. I uh, already said that it's been it's given 60 minutes before the morning or the evening meal. We never give it after the meal. It can cause low blood sugar. We usually do give this one in conjunction with oral diabetics as well. Um, metformin or glipizide are usually the ones. Okay, now we're going to talk about thyroid and antithyroid drugs. These medications correct either 
hypothyroid hormone deficiency known as hypothyroidism or thyroid hormone excess, which is hyperthyroidism. Some facts about thyroid disease. Women are five to eight times more likely to have thyroid problems than men. If undiagnosed, thyroid disease may lead to heart disease, things like weight gain, infertility, or osteoporosis. Most thyroid diseases are lifelong conditions and managed with medication. 20 million Americans have some sort of thyroid issue. Here's some signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperthyroidism for you to look over. I'm not going to read them all to you. Take time to kind of differentiate the two different disease processes. We will be discussing those in med search. A goiter is a disease of the thyroid gland in which the gland actually enlarges and you can see it as a visible swelling in the front of the neck. Uh, the goiter can increase the levels of thyroid activity and um, depending on what type of goiter it is, uh, what we do with it. I just wanted you to see this picture. Look down here at the left how the thyroid enlarges and how large it can actually get. Then we want to know that the treatment for a goiter is a lot of times they will remove all or part of the thyroid gland. It is usually uncomfortable for the patient. It could cause difficulty breathing or swallowing, and it may even cause hyperthyroidism. Thyroid drugs can either be natural or synthetic hormones. They contain T3 or T4 or both. The synthetic versions are levothyroxine sodium, liothyrone, thyronine sodium, Lytrix. The natural versions are thyroid USP and thyroglobulin. Levothyroxine sodium, also known as Synthroid, is the first one we're going to talk about. We usually take this daily before breakfast. This is a medication that should be scheduled apart from other medications and should be taken very early in the morning, such as like 7 a.m. It is a lifelong therapy, as we talked about. It is contraindicated if the patient has had a recent cardiac arrest or myocardial infarction, or if they have thyrotoxicosis. We use this medication for hypothyroidism, myxedemia coma, and cretinism. It can be given PO or IV. Make sure that the IV is pushed very slowly. Um, and of course, we would regulate the dosage for optimal therapeutic effects. Labs that you would want to check for this medication would be a TSH, which is a thyroid stimulating hormone, and a ZT4. Over medications or over medication with this drug can cause hyperthyroidism. Makes sense. Signs and symptoms include arrhythmias, increased heart rate, uh, MI, increased CHF, congestive heart failure symptoms, worsening diabetic control, CNS symptoms, so cerebral symptoms, dyspnea, GI symptoms increased liver function studies, and seizures. Antithyroid drugs include propithyrosil, which is PTU, and radioactive iodines. These are used to treat hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease. Propithyrosil, or PTU, is given um, because we want the thyroid to be in this word called a euthyroid. That's a perfect thyroid. Um, all the labs are perfect. Nothing's wrong with that. Um, the therapeutic effects can start within 24 to 36 hours, but remission um, usually doesn't happen until four months of therapy. So that's a long time to see some results for patients. You do give this um, for, or you give it PO, it's usually every eight hours. Uh, we give this for treatment of hypothyroidism, Graves' disease, 
or uh, possibly a goiter if a surgery or radiation, uh, radioactive iodine isn't an option for that patient. Um, it can cause liver injury. It is contraindicated in pregnancy and lactation. Uh, we talked about the therapeutic effects. We want to take this medication e the same time every day and with meals. Um, it's also used sometimes in what's called a thyroid storm, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, it does have multiple, multiple drug interactions and an extensive list of side effects. So write down these specific side effects. Hepatotoxicity, bleeding, fever, and dermatitis. The dosage goal, like we talked about the euthyroid, is to achieve and maintain T3, T4, and TSH normal levels. Radioactive iodine. This medication decreases the formation and release of thyroid hormone. It can also destroy thyroid tissue. It causes acute radi radiation thyroiditis three to 10 days after treatment. We want to make sure that we're giving this with fruit juice. Um, we're gonna give it to treat hyperthyroidism, maybe thyroid cancer. Adverse reactions include bone marrow suppression, a radiation sickness, which uh, the signs and symptoms of that are hematoemesis, epsitaxis, and nausea and vomiting. These patients are going to be encouraged to void frequently, and we're also going to increase fluids to try to move the radioactive um, particles out of their body. We're going to limit contact with people while they're on this medication because they are radioactive. Um, and we will dispose of their waste per protocol. There's always a special way to do that. Patients complain that um, this tastes brassy or they have a burning sensation when they're taking it. Remember, this is contraindicated in pregnancy and lactation, which seems to be a trend in these medications. So remember this fact. Also, um, remember your drug reaction protocol. So if you notice that you're having a drug reaction, we always, one, stop the medication, two, stabilize the patient, and three, call the physician. So remember those three steps if you have a drug reaction. Lugol solution is our next one. It is a non-radioactive iodine. It is used to decrease the size of a goiter or the thyroid prior to removal. Um, and it can also be given after uh, the removal to control signs and symptoms until the radiation effects take place. It's given PO, contraindicated in pregnancy and lactation. We're going to dilute this with juice and increase fluids to move it through the system faster. Somatotrophin is our next medication. This one is an anterior pituitary hormone or growth hormone. It is used to treat deficiencies in these things. It can be given IM or sub Q and sometimes given topically because this medication is destroyed inside the GI tract. It will never be given PO. Adverse reactions include hyperglycemia, hypercalciuria, and renal calculi. Hypercalciuria is high calcium in the urine, which actually causes renal calculi because renal calculi are oftentimes created by calcium. So those two are related. It can also cause hypersensitivity to the actual med medication itself. We want to be cautious giving this with patients who have diabetes mellitus, and it is contraindicated in prater willi syndrome, severe obesity, and sleep apnea. Vasopressin, also known as desmopressin, is used to treat diabetes insipidus, also given during CPR. It can be given IM, IV, sub-Q, or intranasally. We will want to monitor closely the I's and O's for this medication. Contraindicated in coronary artery disease. Some adverse reactions include water intoxication. Those Signs and symptoms include confusion, seizures, coma, 
sleepiness, pounding headache. It can also cause myocardial ischemia. Addison's disease is a lack of adrenal cortex hormones. You can see here that the patient has bronze pigmentation of the skin, changes in the hair distribution, GI disturbances, weight loss, weakness, postural hypotension, and hypoglycemia. The symptoms of an adrenal crisis are down in the left-hand corner in the square. Profound fatigue, dehydration, vascular collapse, renal shutdown, decreased serum sodium, increased serum potassium. Here's the difference between Addison's disease and Cushing's syndrome. Addison's disease, like we said, is a lack of adrenal cortex hormones, and Cushing's syndrome is caused by a tumor of the pituitary gland. Remembering that Addison's disease, the patients need to add hormones to their body to be normal, um, is an easy way to remember what they need. And then in Cushing's syndrome, they have an extra cushion of hormone, so they want to get rid of that. Easy way to remember those, or try to. So in Addison's disease, we give a medication known as hydrocortisone, which you probably have in your uh, medicine cabinet. But there are different ways to give it other than just a topical cream. Uh, for non-endocrine disorders, we would give it maybe for cancer, for inflammation, inflammation, and allergic reactions. Compl complications of the medication include osteoporosis, adrenal suppression, and infection.